Hi, boys and girls. It's Mrs. Pecora here. Are you ready for our last chapter of the book and some facts about Hurricane Katrina? I want to say thank you for being patient as my dog put um, his head on the book when I was reading the last couple chapters. So if you hear snoring, it is him who is sleeping on the couch. It is not me. I guess he does not like listening to I Survived, which I don't know why because it's a pretty good book. So here we go. At the end of the last chapter, Barry was reunited with his mom and dad and sister. So let's see what happens to them next. Chapter 16. Saturday, September 29th, 2005, Riverside Park, New York City. Barry sat on a bench in the shade. Mom and dad were standing a few feet away watching Cleo climb up the jungle gym. Cruz was snoozing at Barry's feet. Barry had a sketchbook open on his lap, and he was looking at his new drawing of Avico. He finished that morning, keeping his promise to Jay. It had been Jay's idea that they could still enter the contest. Jay had even called the acclaim offices from his grandma's house in Birmingham. I told them the whole story, he said. The man said we can still enter, and they want to meet you. Barry wasn't surprised to hear that. Even four weeks later, Katrina was the biggest story in the country. Every time Barry turned on the TV or got into a taxi with mom or dad, another voice was talking about the hurricane. This is the worst disaster ever to hit America. This is a national tragedy. A great American city had been destroyed. And everyone wanted to hear their story. The kids at Barry's new school, the man who made their sandwiches at the deli on the corner, strangers who overheard mom talking at the bank. They all wanted to know about Katrina. They listened with wide eyes, and then they all said pretty much the same thing. They said the Tuckers were lucky. Barry knew that was true. Mom said it was a miracle. They found Barry on the bridge. Some families had been separated for days or weeks. Some still hadn't found each other. And of course, there were the people who had died, more than a thousand. They were still finding bodies in attics. Barry had nightmares about the storm. He didn't sleep much. Even the sound of Dad turning on the shower in the morning made Barry's heart jump. But yes, he knew he was lucky. Luckier than the tens of thousands of people who'd been stranded for days in the hot and terrifying Superdome. Or the people who'd been stuck on bridges and highways and rooftops. The Tuckers hadn't gone to the Superdome. They'd gone to Lightnings. They'd stayed with Dave for two days, then caught a bus to Houston. Dave boarded up the club and went to Baton Rouge. By then, even he realized that the city wasn't safe. The cousins in Houston spoiled them rotten for one week. Mom and Dad talked about moving there, finding an apartment nearby. But then a call came from the president of that famous music college in New York. There was a job for Dad if he wanted, teaching about New Orleans music. There was an apartment, too, with furniture and room for the whole family. A week later, they were here. Cruz, too. He was a part of the family now. The Red Cross had helped Dad track down Abe and his grandma in Little Rock, Arkansas. Abe and Barry talked on the fan phone, and Abe, the old Abe, had asked Barry if he would keep Cruz. He's not a killer, Abe said. I figured that out. They had a good laugh, and they cried a little too when they talked about their neighborhood. Barry hoped he would see Abe again one day. Mom and Dad came over and sat next to Barry on the bench, clear away from the top of their slide. Dad looked at Barry's drawing of a Vico. That is really something, Dad said. Thanks, said Barry, who liked this one even better than the original. A Vico had a sidekick now, a mutt with floppy ears. Andy had a guardian angel, a beautiful fairy in a yellow rubber raft. He looks like you, Mom said. That's right, said Dad. I see it too. Barry stared at the picture, and he saw what Mom and Dad meant. A Vico's face. It did look something like Barry's. I guess you feel a little like a superhero yourself, Mom said. Nah, <laughs> said Barry, his cheeks heating up. But really, he did. Out there in the flood, Barry had discovered some powers of his own. When it came, bleh. when it was time to go back to the apartment, Barry went to pluck Cleo off the jungle gym. He heard her singing on Blueberry Hill, and he smiled. Dad told Barry he'd sung that song a million times when they'd been on the roof. Dad had jumped into the flood water after Barry, but the current had been too strong. He fought his way back to Mom and Cleo. The three of them had waited out the storm. Mom had said that Dad had called Barry's name so many times that he lost his voice. 
They walked back to Broadway, Barry pushing Cleo in her stroller. Mom pointed out a bakery with a help wanted sign in the window. Dad said they should go to the Bronx Zoo later or the American Museum of Natural History. There's so much to see, Mom said. We have plenty of time, Dad said. It was true. They had time, but not forever. Barry knew they would go back to New Orleans where they belonged. When would that be? When would their city be healed? Barry didn't ask Mom and Dad those questions. He already knew the answer. One day. One day. All right, now, boys and girls. So here is the author. She is saying, after the storm, questions about Katrina. So this is from the author, Lauren Tarshish. For many years before Hurricane Katrina, experts had warned that the levees in New Orleans were not strong enough to withstand a powerful hurricane. In August 2005, their worst predictions came true. Katrina's 125 mile per hour wind sent a gigantic wave of water from the Gulf of Mexico into the canals and lakes surrounding New Orleans. All that water pushed up against the levees and many of them failed. Some crumbling like walls of sand castles. Billions of gallons of water rushed into New Orleans. Nearly 1,000 people drowned in the first hours of flooding. Tens of thousands more were like the Tuckers, caught in a nightmare, struggling to survive as water filled their home. Thousands of people were rescued from the rooftops and attics, often by volunteers like Nell. Nearly 50,000 were stranded in the Superdome in agonizing heat without enough food or water. It took five full days for help to arrive and another week before Everham was evacuated from the city. In the weeks and months after Katrina, many wondered if the great American city of New Orleans would ever recover. There was so much damage. Tens of thousands of houses were destroyed as well as schools, hospitals, police stations, roads, and businesses. There was no electricity or clean water and 80% of the city was covered with water filled with toxic chemicals and waste. The city's 440,000 Residents were scattered around the country. But New Orleans did survive, and years later, it continues to recover, building by building, house by house, tree by tree, road by road, family by family. 75% of residents have returned. To many visitors, the city seems as vibrant as it always was, with unforgettable music and food, beautiful buildings and gardens, and streets that bustle with energy, unlike any other city in America. But in some of the poorest and hardest hit neighborhoods, recovery has been painfully slow. If Barry were to come back to the Lower Ninth Ward today, he would see few of his neighbors smiling down from their porches. Much of the Lower Nine is still abandoned. Only 19% of that neighborhood's residents have returned. I've studied dozens of natural disasters over the years, earthquake, volcanic eruptions, and shipwrecks, and blizzards, and hurricanes, but... None of these events made me feel as sad or angry as I felt reading about the horrifying experiences of those who lived through Katrina. Why didn't our leaders do a better job protecting the beautiful city of New Orleans and its citizens? With so many warnings about the dangers of flooding, why wasn't more done to make the levee stronger? Why was help so slow to arrive to the survivors? As a writer of fiction, I could give Barry and his family a happy ending, but even after reading everything I could find about this storm, I still could not find the answers to these questions. Lauren Tarshish. All right, boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed this story. Stay tuned for our next reading. Not sure what it's going to be yet, but it'll be something good. Bye-bye.